You've got to be one very evil if you got everyone talking about what you did. Well, not recently, but changing the cause of history is definitely a sinister level type of evil. And that's exactly what evil company Monsanto did. There's a lot of crops in the world, corn especially, with over 300 million tons of it cultivated back in 2014. So what happens when these corns have been genetically modified? Toxicity, cancer, allergic reactions, antibiotic resistance and immunosuppression, to mention a few. See how bad it gets. In 1983, Monsanto became one of the four companies to introduce the use of genes in plant cultivation. And in 1987, it carried out field trials of genetically modified crops. That wasn't all. Monsanto also became one of the very first companies to begin the application of biotechnological industrial business models to agriculture. It used techniques created by the biotech drug companies, which resulted in the exploitation of biological patents, responsible for the production of several crops like corn, which are then used to make different products. Monsanto's GMO runs deeper than we realize. Corn is the most popular animal feed, and when you discover that 85% of all corn in the US is genetically modified, you'll realize GMOs are closer to us than we think. That's why we're going to delve deep into Monsanto and its evil GMO foods. We at Business Chronicles tell extraordinary business stories. Please subscribe to our channel to help us make more videos. The history of Monsanto began at the start of the 20th century, in 1901, when John Francis Queenie, who was 42 at the time and already a 30-year veteran of the nascent pharmaceutical industry, founded the company. Monsanto was formed with his personal money and the extra capital he got from a soft drink distributor. Despite the company later became as we will reveal later, the company was originally formed out of love. Joan Francis named the company after his precious wife, Olga Mendes Monsanto, who was the heir and descendant of the Monsanto family. At the time when the company began operations, its first products were basically food additives like artificial sweeteners, saccharine, vanilla and caffeine. Joan Francis Queenie had quite a remarkable early childhood. For some, it was a miracle he became the founder of Monsanto. In 1871, the Great Chicago Fire destroyed his family's house and left them homeless when Joan was only 12 years old. As a result of the event, Joan had to quit his education and start working as a full-time office boy as a wholesaler in a wholesale drug company. Through hard work and dedication, Joan was able to climb up the ranks of the pharmaceutical company and by 1897, he moved to San Luis where he started working for the Mayer Brothers Drug Company, which was at the time one of the largest wholesale pharmaceutical companies. After working there for two years, Joan spent the entirety of his life savings to purchase a sulfur refinery, which tragically burned down the next day. The event crushed him and so, John kept working at Mayer Brothers. Two years later, contrary to what the company later became, John Francis initially started Monsanto with the aim of producing saccharine, a known artificial sweetener that's over 300 times sweeter than the regular table sugar and without any effective nutritional value, which he then began selling to his former employers, Mayer Brothers. He eventually married his love, Olga Monsanto, five years later in 1906. The synthesization of saccharine was first carried out in 1879, and while it has a widely known use today as sugar substitute, no one in the United States even knew what it was back in the 19s. At the time, Germany had successfully created a strong monopoly on the production of saccharine with the United States, left with no single manufacturer. So when John Newley established his business, it became the very first United States saccharine manufacturing company, and the American market was extremely lucrative due to the demand. Coca-Cola Company was one of Monsanto's earliest customers, and till date, they still use saccharine for their famous Diet Cokes. To increase its operation, Joan added two more products to Monsanto's manufacturing. They were also food additives, vanillin and cumarin, both of which were only produced in Germany until Monsanto introduced it to the American market. In the first decade after Monsanto's formation, the company barely made any profit from its sales because they were facing severe undercutting from the Germans. By 1919, Monsanto began expansion into the European market by entering into a partnership with Greiser's chemical work company in Moore, Wales. As a result of the partnership, Monsanto started producing more vanillin and aspirin, including its raw ingredient salicylic acid. But that wasn't all. The venture also produced rubber processing chemicals. At the start of the 1920s, Monsanto further expanded its product range to include more industrial chemicals like PCB or polychlorinated biphenyl. Now here's where it started getting a little bit interesting, or perhaps should we say sinister. We'll see. Polychlorinated biphenyl often comes in several molecular configurations, to be accurate, 209, all of which are very toxic to humans. 
Now, PCBs are proven pollutants and carcinogens that strongly resist heat and acid, requiring around 200 days of constant and direct sunlight to begin its breaking down process. Before the 1970s, polychlorinated biphenyls were used as coolants in several electrical devices, especially in capacitors and power transformers. There is some chance that if you visited some rural areas in the States, you might still find some transformers with the BCB warning label on it. Before it was eventually banned in 1979, Mozanta was the only company in the US manufacturing BCB for over 50 years. To portray the evil Monsanto was doing, leaked internal documents in 2002 showed that they were in fact aware of the toxic threat posed by the consumption of BCB. Worst case, the company was aware of this information for over a decade before it was eventually banned. But it wasn't the beginning of Monsanto's evil attempt at bypassing environmental laws. In fact, its attempt can be tracked back to 1926 when the companies established and incorporated a town in Illinois called Monsanto and now known as Soget. It was created as a way to provide little or no regulation and low taxes to Monsanto's plant, since local jurisdictions were majorly responsible for environmental rules at the time. So Monsanto built and opened its largest pilochlorinated biphenyl factory there, avoiding a huge chunk of tax. As of today, the town still exists, with only about 159 residents. Monsanto's scandalous involvement in PCB still remains the company's earliest example of how its evil and extreme for-profit culture knowingly jeopardized human lives. In 1936, Monsanto, while aiming to secure the expertise of Charles Allen Thomas and Carroll, a Hochschild brought Thomas and Hochschild laboratories located in Daytona, Ohio. After the acquisition, it became the central research development for Monsanto and Thomas ended up spending the rest of the life's career serving as president and board chair at Monsanto. By the time the Second World War started in 1939, Monsanto had already become wildly established as the first chemical supplier to the United States military. Their most valuable product at the time was terine, a compound crucial for the production of synthetic rubber. Around the same time, Monsanto was shockingly, or perhaps surprisingly, involved as a contributor to the Manhattan Project, as they aided in the production of the polonium-based initiators that were used in two atomic bombs detonated in Japan. Monsanto's journey into the agriculture industry began after the war, when it started developing pesticides for farm use. One of its first products, dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethan, also known as DDT, was officially produced in 1944. And like polychlorinated biphenyl, it was banned 30 years later for its extreme level of toxicity. We don't know about you, but if this isn't some evil, sinister type of company, what is? Well, its next herbicide product was even worse, and you couldn't even see it coming if you had a thousand guesses. Named Agent Orange, or later infamously known for its use as defoliant by the United States military during Operation Ranch Hand during the Vietnam War. While Agent Orange was an effective chemical that effectively destroyed the crops of the Viet Cong, it was also very toxic that it eventually contaminated over 3 million people in Vietnam, further causing another half a million children to be born with varying deformities. The effects were so similar to leukemia and cancer suffered by the Japanese after the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Only this time, Monsanto had a hand in the genocide. At the start of the 1970s, Monsanto started seeing huge progress and success in the development and production of LED lights. Interestingly, Monsanto was also the very first company to produce them in the mass, bringing the price from a whopping $200 to an astonishing 10 cents for a piece. It didn't take long after Monsanto's supposed success before the United States government's finally caught up to Monsanto's irresponsible usage of harmful chemicals. The ban on polychlorinated biphenyl and other pesticides severely affected Monsanto's revenue by billions of dollars. Furthermore, the company also faced several class action lawsuits, which also cost them millions. During this period, the company made a huge decision to switch from its original focus on chemical production to agriculture biotechnology. The transition happened at the start of the 1980, when biotechnology was still very young and a wonder to behold. Eventually, in 1983, Monsanto hired a group of scientists with Robert Fraley as the leader and becoming the first in history to successfully carry out genetic modification of plants. The achievement started a new movement in the agricultural world, introducing the world to a phenomenon that they would eventually claim pose more harm than good – GMOs. Well, contrary to what a large part of the world thought, genetically modified plants weren't as bad as they made it seem. The major reason people thought of it as a negative breakthrough is because people often, out of greed, took good things to extreme until it became bad. Monsanto took the production of genetically modified crops to a new level. 
At the start of the 1980s, Monsanto was hit with several lawsuits leading to bans on some of its top-selling products. However, during that period, they discovered a new product called glyphosate, a strong and potent herbicide that eventually helped the company escape bankruptcy. Monsanto sold its new herbicide products using the name Roundup, and within a period of two decades, it became the number one herbicide in the entire United States. In the past, it was like a standard of farming, the most farmers had to plant their seeds a good distance from each other. The reason for this was, they needed the distance to work the land, unless it would be overrun by weeds, growing around the crops and eventually killing them. When Monsanto developed genetically modified crops, farmers now had a new way to cultivate the crops. They would now plant their crops at a close distance to each other, dropping Monsanto's Roundup on the crop without causing significant harm. As a result, it became a huge boost for the farmers who saw an increase in their crop yield, as well as a reduced capital and labor spent on tilling the land. It didn't take long before most farmers switched to the solution provided by Monsanto. Due to the license obtained by Monsanto, it was until the 2000s, the only producer of glyphosate during this time. The company expanded its operation to what it is today. Roundup was a start, and since its inception, Monsanto had spent several billions in developing different seeds and pesticides. The company's creative use of patents on its seed was one of the major reasons why they saw an immense level of success in the seed business. The rule was, farmers who used the seeds were not allowed to share them with or sell them to anyone else. As a result, Monsanto was able to ensure that its revenue was stable and growing since there was no ripoff. The rule was so strong that farmers could be found liable in a rare instance where the wind blows Monsanto's seeds from the neighbor's farm. In the 1990s, so Monsanto makes some business moves in a bid to increase the company's operation. In 1994, Monsanto released a new recombinant DNA version of bovine somatotropin, which was branded as Solic. However, the business was later sold to Ellie Lilly and Company. Two years later, Monsanto bought a biotechnology company that had just become the first to generate transgenic cotton, peanuts, soybeans and other crops. The company, Agrocetus, had been the source of Monsanto's licensing technology since the start of 1990. In 1997, Monsanto divested Salutia, a company that was originally created to absorb and handle the responsibilities of Monsanto's polychlorinated biphenyl business, its liabilities and other activities related to the manufacturing of organic chemical products. Monsanto's entrance into the maize seed business happened a year prior in 1996, when it bought over 40% of DeKalb, eventually buying the entire corporation two years later. DeKalb initially published an annual report that cited Monsanto's Law, a biotechnological take-on, indicating the direction of its future operations and exponential growth using biotechnology. That same year, Calgin, a Californian GMO company, was acquired by Monsanto, and in 1998, Monsanto's targeted and purchased the international seed business of American Globe Food Corporation, Cargill, to improve its access distribution and sales in 51 countries. The following year, Monsanto sold off its business, Seminis Incorporation, and in December of the same year, it reached a merger agreement with Pharmacia and Upjohn in a deal valued at $27 billion. The company's agriculture division became a fully owned subsidiary of Monsanto's new Pharmacia, a medical research division that produced products like Celebrex. Monsanto continued its acquisition in the late 2000s when it bought Delta and Pineland Company, a significant cotton seed grower, for a whopping $1.5 billion in 2007. In order to approve the deal, the Department of Justice stated that Monsanto was to divest its Stoneville and Next Gen Cotton business, which it sold to Bayer and Americot respectively. During that time, Monsanto also made the decision to quit its big breeding business, Monsanto Choice Genetics, by selling it to New Sham Genetics LC in November that year. The sale divested Monsanto from any and all swine-related patents, patent application, and all other intellectual property. Also in 2007, Monsanto and BASF agreed and announced a partnership in the research, development, and marketing and sales of new plant biotechnology products. The following year, Monsanto bought De Reuter, a Dutch seed company, for $546 million. In August that year, it sold its Salic bovine somatotropin brand and its related business to Elanco Animal Health, which is a division of Eli Lilly & Co., for $300 million. This was followed by a $210 million purchase of Precision Planting Incorporation in 2012. The company produces software design and computer hardware to allow farmers to improve the yield and productivity of their crops through planting more precisely. By the following year, another big money acquisition followed. It was almost as if Monsanto was trying to diversify and expand itself away from the evil it did in the past. It purchased San Francisco Climate Corp for almost a billion dollars. 
The company's focus was the prediction of local weather forecasts for farmers using a data modeling system and historical data with the rule that, should the forecast be wrong, the farmer would be compensated. In 2015, Monsanto was involved in a failed 46.5 billion acquisition of Swiss agrobiotechnology rival Syngenta. At the time, Monsanto was considered as the world's largest seed supplier with 26% control of the entire global seed market. A year after attempted to buy its biggest competitor, Monsanto agreed to a $66 billion takeover by Bayer. The deal received regulatory clearance on the condition that Bayer announced the sale of a large portion of its current agriculture businesses, including its herbicide and seed business, to BASF. The deal was finally approved by the European Union on March 21, 2018, and in the United States on May 29, 2018. After the acquisition, Bayer announced that it was going to discontinue the Monsanto name operating solely under its brand. As part of the merger agreement, Bayer promised to retain Monsanto's 9,000 jobs in the United States, adding an extra 3,000 new positions in the United States. At the time, both parties said the merger's combined agriculture business intended to spend around $16 billion on development and research in the next six years and a further $8 billion solely for research and development in the United States. Despite the merger, the company was hit with several lawsuits. Probably, the merger made more people affected by the company's products. By October 2019, over 42,000 plaintiffs claimed that glyphosate herbicides were the cause of their cancer after the International Agency for Research on Cancer made a report in 2015 linking glyphosate to causes of cancer in humans. Monsanto later denied the allegation stating that the Roundup wasn't carcinogenic. In 2017, a further 40 plaintiffs submitted a lawsuit to the Alameda County, a California Superior Court branch, requesting damages caused by Monsanto's glyphosate-based weed killers, including its Roundup, while also demanding a jury trial. As the plaintiffs kept coming forward, Monsanto stands for weakened, and by 2018, it lost its first decided case to Dwayne Johnson, who had a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and was awarded damages to the tune of $289 million after a San Francisco jury gave verdict that Monsanto had failed to properly warn consumers of the cancer risk proposed by their herbicides. After an appeal, the damages awarded was later reduced to $78.5 million. However, Monsanto was unwilling to pay the amount, so they asked to apply the court and consider a new trial motion. Verdict was eventually upheld in 2020 with the damage fee reduced to $21.5 million. Also in 2019, the company was also found responsible for Edwin Herdman's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and was ordered to pay a sum of $80 million in damages. After a long battle with several cases, Bayer eventually agreed to pay settlement to over 100,000 Roundup cancer lawsuit victims to the sum of $9.6 billion and a further $1.5 billion for future claims. Monsanto's 1997 transformation of its old chemical business into a separate and a new company called Solutia was an attempt to launch a fresh start. On its website, they claimed to be a new company which just randomly happened to share their name as the evil predecessor. Truth is, it was all a lie to show and deceive the public. The new executive of Monsanto were the same old people that had originally governed the previous company for several years. You know how evil characters try to cover up their tracks. Yep, that's exactly what Monsanto was up to when they sought to wash their hands off the questionable and evil past of Monsanto. After the formation of Solutia, the company took over not only the dying chemical business, but also a large chunk of its ligation and lawsuits relating Monsanto's polychlorinated biphenyl and other industrial pollutants. As a result of this, it didn't come as a surprise when six years later, Solutia fired for bankruptcy. It was eventually saved when it was swallowed up by Eastern Chemical Company. While the new Monsanto hadn't been able to totally get rid of its evil reputation, the global expansion is still on the rise with over $15 billion of revenue. Well, half of that amount came from the sales of Roundup pesticides and the genetically modified crop seeds resistant to it. Truth is, it's quite sad that despite the evil committed by Monsanto in the past, as well as all the controversies and boycotting, the company's products are deeply embedded in modern agriculture as they own all foods in your house. Sadly, there's no getting rid of them, but at least now you know. If you enjoyed watching the video, do leave a like, subscribe to the channel for more interesting stories and hidden secrets.